So this week, uh, we're going to get into more detail with um, optimization in Discover. And I'm going to start today's session going over some of the elements of optimization and um, some of those elements that we have to actually implement in our generative models to get them to work with Discover and to make sure that Discover is able to optimize our designs uh, in the right way. So I'm going to show some slides and talk about some of the uh, elements of optimization. And then we're going to spend the rest of the class uh, looking at some test models in Grasshopper and getting them to optimize in Discover. Uh, we're going to do a uh, demo model from scratch, a really simple model just to test things out. And then we're going to open up a few of the sample models that actually come with, with Discover. OK, so last week we talked about um, this idea of optimization and generative design and how generative design is actually composed of two different parts. On the one hand, there's the design work that we do, which is basically creating a parametric model. In this case, we're gonna be using uh, Grasshopper to create these models. And this model basically defines our design problem for the optimization algorithm. And there's two primary components of this model that are really important in order to be able to connect it to the optimization algorithm. So it can actually do the automated process of discovering uh, the best design solutions. And those are the input parameters that drive the model and the output metrics, which tell the algorithm how to evaluate each design solution. So last week, we looked at this really simple bridge example. And this is a kind of conceptual diagram of what we call the design space model of that bridge. So this design space model is something we design and program into our grasshopper model. And it describes first a set of parameters here, inputs on the left side. So we have six uh, continuous inputs, five categorical inputs, and every combination of those inputs creates a different example of a bridge. And then every one of those example bridges is also passed through a simulation, which gives us a few outputs that tell the algorithm what we're looking for in the design. So here for the bridge, we had the weight, the displacement, and the utilization, the stress utilization. So those are just like the numerical quantities or characteristics that we know are important about our design. Um, but in order to get things working really well with Discover, it's not enough to just have a bunch of parameters and have a bunch of metrics. We actually have to give a little bit more information to Discover about exactly what are the types of those parameters? So how do they work? Um, and how do those parameters control what's going on in the model? And also, what are the type of the objective uh, of the outputs? So how should the computer think about the numbers that are coming out of that model? Do we want them to be uh, big numbers? Do we want them to be small numbers? Do we want them to be hitting a certain uh, quantity? And so this is where we get into a little bit more depth. You know, when we talk about inputs and outputs, exactly how those carry the information to Discover. And this is actually uh, almost everything that the Discover plugin in Grasshopper does is it lets you be a little bit more specific about this data so that when we connect our models to the optimization process, the optimization knows how to control the model and knows what it's looking for during the optimization. So in general, there, the, this slide shows all the components of uh, optimization. And it's broken down here. Number one is the parameters. Those are the inputs. And then the second two, uh, the second and third are the outputs. And we actually have two kinds of outputs that we typically uh, work with. And there's just some description about the different variations uh, for each one. So let's just go through this. Um, on the parameter side, you know, when we are working in Grasshopper and parametric design, typically we think of parameters as just numbers. And when, you know, when you set up the sliders in Grasshopper, you're not really thinking about like, is that continuous or a categorical parameter? All you know is that's a number, you can control it and it affects your model. And that's fine when we're using the param parameters ourselves, right? We're just kind of playing around with them. But in order to do its best work, this cover actually has to know the nature of that parameter. And we can actually think of three different types of input parameters. I'm going to describe them here, and we're going to actually see 
each one of these three types in the demo models that we'll be looking at uh, later in the class. So the first one is called a continuous parameter. And this is the most basic type of input parameter. This is what we think of as like when we see a slider in Grasshopper, right? When we have that slider, you create a bound, uh, um, a kind of um, a domain of that slider, right? We have a minimum value, we have a maximum value, and then you can just slide that parameter between those two extremes. And that's basically what a continuous parameter means. Um, it's a value that varies continuously, as the name suggests, within a certain range. And we typically represent this with a, a decimal number. And continuous parameters are really good for describing uh, parameters in our model that control things in our model continuously. So for example, if we had a building model and we wanted a parameter to control its height or maybe the width or the, the, the depth of the floor plan, that would be a good thing to represent with a continuous parameter, right? Because we can say, okay, our building can be no thinner than like 10 feet uh, wide, and but it can't go more than like 20 feet wide. And now we're sliding that parameter to explore every variation in between. But that's, that's a kind of continuous uh, control of the model. And the Discover actually wants to know this information because when Discover is playing with those parameters, it's using that information to figure out how it needs to explore that parameter. If it knows that it's a continuous value, it's actually gonna tune it. It's actually gonna go up or down and see what the results are. So it wants to know that in fact, that is a continuous parameter and that's how it controls the model. Now the second kind of parameter is a categorical parameter. And here it might not be so obvious what the difference is because categorical parameters are also, are just a single number. But here the way that they control the model is different because a categorical parameter isn't varying continuously within a range, it's actually choosing a single option from a set, a limited set of possible options. So for example, if we had our building model and now we had the facade sort of described, we had every panel of the facade, every window opening in the building uh, as an element. And we wanted to choose uh, maybe like a, a type of window, right? Or like maybe like a screen or something for each panel. And so we wouldn't want to represent that with a continuous parameter because that would imply that there was like a whole range of possible options when in fact, maybe there's only two or three options. So here we describe that with a continuous uh, categorical parameter. And a categorical parameter is still a number, but usually we use whole numbers within a certain set of possibilities. So if we have uh, three possible window panel types for each opening, we would use a categorical parameter and it would choose a value like zero, one, or two to select those from the set of possibilities. And the key with uh, categorical parameters, how they're different with Discover is that now Discover knows that it's not just sliding across those values, even though we use a number, it actually knows that those things don't vary continuously. That the panel option one, two, or three don't necessarily have any relationship to each other. You know, the choice of the second panel doesn't mean that somehow uh, between the first and the third, there is no relationship. And it actually uses that in the optimization process. So here, you know, even though we use numbers for both and you know, we can just kind of round off a decimal and get a whole number, technically it's possible to, 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 to you know, take the same parameter and have it be either a continuous or a categorical, but it's really important to understand the difference and use the right one because it's just gonna make your optimization process better and mean that you're gonna get better results in a shorter amount of time. Because like I said, behind the scenes, it's actually changing the way Discover works. And we'll see that more in a few weeks where we go uh, under the hood with Discover and I'll actually show you some of those operators and how Discover is using, you know, continuous and categorical parameters uh, differently. The third type parameter is a special parameter uh, and it's called a sequence. And a sequence parameter isn't just a single numerical value, it's actually a set of numbers, integers, which define an order of something. And typically we have like a number of elements that we wanna sort. We wanna create a specific order of those elements. So for example, 
if you had a generator model, and we'll see this in a few weeks, um, that uses subdivision to take like a boundary and split it up into a bunch of rooms. So we split up the rooms based on some other parameters. And now we have, let's say six rooms. And now we have, and we have six programs like living room, kitchen, whatever that we want to assign to each of those rooms. So the process of taking like a list of programs and a list of spaces and figuring out how to map the programs onto the spaces, we can represent that mapping with a sequence parameter. Another example we'll see later in this class is the traveling salesman problem where you have a set of cities and you're trying to figure out the order of cities to go to uh, in order to minimize the, the total route between them. And so that order of cities can also be represented with a sequence parameter. And so typically this is represented as a list of integers uh, from zero to one less than the number of things we want to order. So if we want to order like five things, Discover will create a list of five numbers and it's going to be the numbers zero, one, two, three, four in some kind of order. And then we can interpret that order in our grasshopper model to control them in different ways. So that's the set of uh, parameter types and each of these three parameter types are represented with its own component in Discover that we'll see in a little bit. Okay, now let's go on to the output types. So like I said, the outputs are just metrics that we calculate from our parametric model and they're supposed to tell the algorithm what we're looking for in our design. Without this, all the algorithm can do is just generate random designs, which is not that useful. Uh, so we have to give it some kind of indication of you know, what we're looking for uh, so we can generate these outputs. But just like with parameters, and even more importantly here, we actually have to tell it both what kind of output it is and how to evaluate it, like which direction we want it to optimize. So there's two basic types of outputs. And this is pretty much universal to like any optimization algorithm. Um, this, these two types of outputs are supported by most like genetic algorithms, but also pretty much every other uh, algorithm, uh, optimization algorithm out there. And they're pretty much like, they're, they're a pretty general idea because it doesn't really have anything to do with the algorithm itself. It's more about how to tell the algorithm what our intentions are for our outputs. And there's two types, uh, objectives and constraints. I'll explain a little bit about how they're different. So an objective tells the computer um, something like uh, how we want to push our design, like in what direction we want to push our design. So that tells it, tells it the goals of our design process, right? If we had a bridge, for example, we can set the weight as an objective, and then we have to tell the computer What's the goal of that objective? And it's basically two options. We either want to take that value and minimize it. So we want to tell the algorithm to push that value as small as possible. Or we can maximize it, right? We can tell the algorithm, whatever this is, we want to make it as big as possible. So the key to objectives is we don't have a concrete idea about what that value should be. And that's, that's the whole point of optimization, right? We don't know what it should be. We can create a model to uh, figure out different options. And we can measure these things. And all we know is we just want that thing to be um, as good as possible, right? So for the bridge example, we might say, here's a bridge and I want it to be as lightweight as possible. And that's a really typical structural optimization problem, right? I want this thing to perform, but I want it to be the least possible way. Or we can take the structural uh, stiffness, and we can say we want that to be as high as possible. That stiffness, we want to drive to the opposite extreme, right? Make that bridge as strong as it possibly can while being as light as it possibly can. So that's an objective. And to drive an optimization process, at a minimum, we always need at least one objective. Because without an objective to follow, there's nothing really for the algorithm to do, right? It's just making random stuff. So we'll see in some of the examples. Um, we can do examples of uh, optimization with a single objective. And so that's just going to try to optimize one uh, metric as much as possible. Or we can do two or more objectives where it's trying to optimize for two, two or more things at once. 
And we'll see what that means in terms of the outputs that we'll get um, from the algorithm, because now it's not just meeting one goal, it's meeting multiple goals, which may actually compete with each other. So now there's no way of having actually like one best design. Maybe you have a range of designs that each optimize that kind of trade off in different ways. But this, the objectives are the main kind of metrics that we give to the algorithm. And they give us the relative uh, performance of the different designs. So with an objective, because it's, it's a continuous value uh, that we're trying to sort of push to the extreme, we can always say that one design is better than another if it has a better value for one of these objectives. So let's talk about constraints. So constraints are the other type of output that we can assign. So any number that we generate from our grasshopper model using discover, we can actually assign it to be either an objective or a constraint based on our intentions. And the constraint works a little bit differently than an objective. Uh, here, we actually know what a value we want or more precisely, we know what the limitation is. So a constraint gives us a kind of hard criteria or condition that we say represents whether a design is successful or is not successful. So an objective is a kind of continuous relative measure. A constraint is a hard rule. And there's three types. We can tell a, con a, a constraint can define a number as being uh, needing to be at least a certain number, right? So that's a minimum. So we can say, um, the, the stiffness of the bridge has to be at least a certain number. Now, if it goes over that number, that's fine. It's not better or worse. We're just saying it meets that constraint. If it goes under that number, then we say that design is not valid. So that's actually causes the design to fail, right? And we use this a lot in structural simulation for controlling things like stress utilization. And in fact, we saw that in this slide that weight and displacement, displacement is the inverse of stiffness. We actually set those as minimums. So these are two objectives. And then for utilization, we actually have a constraint that's saying that it needs to be 50% utilization or less. And if it goes over 50%, which means there's an element which is going more than half of its stress capacity, it's actually a failed design. And these constraints um, control the optimization differently than the, opti than the objectives. Objectives are always trying to exploit, like they're always trying to be a little bit better. Constraints, it's just trying to meet that requirement. Okay, and there's uh, two other ways to define it. You, you can uh, specify that it has to be at least a certain number or over, or the inverse of that. You, have, you can say at least it has to be at most a certain number, but it can be under or you can set it as a hard constraint to actually equal a certain number, right? So you can say, if you're designing a building, you can say, I absolutely need this floor plan to have six rooms and any design with seven or five rooms is not valid. And we'll see it a little bit later in the course when we get kind of um, under the hood of discover how the algorithm actually uses these objectives and constraints differently while it's optimizing. But in general, the number one focus of the algorithm first is gonna to be to satisfy all the constraints because what the constraints have defined is basically the acceptance criteria for the design. If a design breaks a constraint, it doesn't matter if it breaks it by a little bit or by a lot, it's actually called invalid. So it's gonna to try to reduce the number of invalid designs uh, first and foremost. And then once it figures out how to ensure that all the designs are valid, then it's gonna push the objectives uh, to be as good as possible, all right? And like I said, we need at least one objective to kind of steer the algorithm into a direction. Uh, we don't necessarily need any constraints. And most optimization problems, like uh, you know, when you're starting out, you're not gonna use constraints, but they're a really good tool because they give us this like more nuanced way to actually tell the algorithm what we're looking for. And that's really what it's all about. You know, when we're doing this optimization, you have to understand that this is an automated process. It's not guaranteeing any kind of success or any kind of results. The results of the optimization of this automated process are only as good as the design of your model 
and how you define the input parameters and how you define the outputs. And the more information and nuance that you can give to the algorithm in terms of these uh, inputs and outputs, the better it's gonna perform, the more it's gonna give you what you're looking for. Okay, so for the rest of the class, um, we're gonna do some demos in Grasshopper and Discover. First, I'm gonna do a, an entire model from scratch. It's gonna be a really simple, dumb model, but we're gonna see the whole process of like starting with a blank canvas, creating a parametric model, uh, starting the Discover server, connecting that model to uh, a set of inputs and outputs using the, uh, the Discover Grasshopper library, and then finally running the optimization I'm going to show you an overview of the, the discovery interface and all the different components involved. And then after that, I'm actually going to open up five more models. And these models are included with discover in the discover folder. You can open them up in your own um, grasshopper window. And they're actually going to show, allow us to see a few different examples. They're all like really simple models, right? The idea is to have like the grasshopper thing uh, very simple, but they're going to show us different combinations of both input types and output types. So we're going to see the first example is going to have a continuous inputs with a single objectives, no constraints. Second one is going to have continuous inputs with two objectives. So we'll see how that is different. Again, no constraints. Uh, we're going to see another example with uh, discrete or categorical inputs and a single objective. Then we're going to look at the bridge that we looked at last week. Uh, it actually combines both continuous and categorical inputs. Um, and we actually can use both multiple objectives and constraints in that model. So we'll see how that affects the output of the model. And then finally, we're going to look at the traveling salesman problem, which uses the, uh, the, the sequence parameter type uh, with a single, uh, single objective.